Thank you for giving me an opportunity to be, come to beautiful Chicago and this great venue. I'm going to try to explain Bitcoin very quickly in 15 minutes. Uh, it's quite a challenge, but I think it's doable. Um, in Spanish, we have a saying that goes something like, when the genius points at the moon, the fool looks at the finger. And I find that that's quite appropriate with Bitcoin. You know, when someone finds Bitcoin for the first time, hears about Bitcoin for the first time, um, we tend to focus on one of its many very, very interesting features. It may be that you are super interested in the cryptography of Bitcoin, or it may be that you're very interested in the mining of Bitcoin, or it may be that you're very interested in who's Satoshi Nakamoto, the mysterious creator of Bitcoin. All of these features are incredibly attractive, but in being so attractive, we gravitate to them too quickly, and we miss the bigger picture of why, why does Bitcoin matter. And that's what I want to talk about today. I think that Bitcoin matters because it may be the best form of money that we have ever seen. And it may not be very easy to notice that because it's early. And Bitcoin may do for money what TCP IP did for information. But it's very early. We are like equivalent of 1992 for TCP IP before there was a browser. And it took a lot of imagination to understand how the internet may change the world. The first way I think to understand Bitcoin is to understand the history of money and the role of money. Um, anthropologists say that there's Never, there, there's no evidence of any tribe, much less a civilization, that ever used barter for trade. And that should be quite counterintuitive to most of us, because we are taught in school that we first bartered, and then we invented money because bartering was, was too hard. Well, that's not true. That never happened. From about 100,000 years ago to about uh, 25,000 years ago, the way we did trade was that Everybody in our tribe would know that uh, you killed a big buffalo. And I would come up to you and say, hey, you're not going to eat that whole buffalo. Can I have a little bit of meat? And you would decide whether you want to give me some meat or not. And other, other members from the tribe would come and ask you for some meat. And you would decide who do you give meat to and who do you don't give meat to. And you have to remember who you gave meat to and because you hope that they will pay you back somehow sometime in the future. It's a very subjective system, but that's how trade worked. We all walked around with these subjective ledgers in our minds of who owes us what. And hopefully those people eventually repaid us, and hopefully they repaid us in something that felt fair to us. It was never going to be usually not in the same way we paid them. It's an incredibly subjective system, but we used it for a very, very long time, for 75,000 years at least, longer than any other system, until someone very intelligent in our tribe came up with a new technology, an innovation, and said, you know what? Uh, when says, can I have a little bit of your firewood? Everybody knows that you have a lot of firewood. And I said, sure, here's your firewood. And this time, this person said, you know, we're going to try a new technology, a new innovation. Here are some beads for you. And I said, no, I don't, I don't need beads. Thank you. And said, no, this is not about whether you want or need beads. We're going to use beads to keep track of our debt. So we don't have to remember them subjectively anymore. You just keep the beads, and that will be how much you are owed. And it was such a successful technology that it just took off. And very quickly, in a couple thousand years, it's impossible to find some tribe or some civilization that doesn't have some form of ledger, objective ledger. Some tribes chose salt, some others chose rocks, um, seashell, different forms of ways to keep track of debts in their society and their tribe. Anthropologists go as far as saying that if you describe to them the environment of a tribe, they can easily predict what's going to emerge as a ledger in that tribe, because it's always something that most, the most important quality that that object has is that it's scarce. It, it makes sense, because if it's something that we are going to use to keep track of debt, if it's not scarce, if we use tree leaves, I can simply pick leaves from a tree and create fake debt to benefit myself at the expense of everybody else. So scarcity is the most important attribute of these things to keep track of, of debt. But also, there are five other attributes that are very important. One, that they are durable, that they don't decay or corrode, etc. that they be transportable, that they be divisible, recognizable, and fungible. This system 
took off and worked really, really well from about, from about, for about 20,000 years, from about 25,000 years ago to about 5,000 years ago. And 5,000 years ago, what happened is that tribes began to trade with other tribes, and they needed something in common. We had beads, you had seashells, and we couldn't trade. And what happened then is that gold emerged as not the universal ledger for one tribe, but the first universal ledger. And it was gold because it was something that was universally scarce. But it was also transportable, durable, divisible, recognizable, and fungible. In this very short and uh, high-level history of money, I want to illustrate three myths um, that if you um, believe in any of these three myths, it's really, really hard to understand the proper function of money and, 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 and why Bitcoin matters. The first myth is that, Bitcoin, that money was born out of barter when actually it was born out of a need to keep track of debts. Um, the second myth, and perhaps the biggest myth, is that money is backed by something. And when actually money has never been and will never be backed by anything, it's just a ledger. And people say, well, but uh, the, the, the dollar used to be backed by something. Right now it's not backed by anything, but it used to be backed by gold. But in truth, that implies that gold is backed by something or has some intrinsic value. And the truth is gold does not have any intrinsic value beyond being a great ledger, beyond being very scarce. We use it for jewelry because it's very scarce, because it represents wealth and power, but not because it's pretty. And this is a very common misunderstanding about money, that it's just a ledger. It's not backed by anything. And the final one is that money exists because it's created by government and because it's sponsored by government. And the truth is that money has been around for a lot longer than governments have been around, and it will be uh, around as long as there are um, social interactions around. It, it fulfills a very basic social need. From where we are standing today, it's hard to understand the importance of gold, because right now the universal ledger is not gold. It's, um, it's the US dollar. And before that, for about 500 years, we have had these reserve currencies, first the, the um, um, Portuguese escudo, then the Spanish, then the French, then the Dutch, then the British pound, and now the dollar. All of them have been the universal um, uh, ledger, the reserve currencies for about 100 years. But none of them have been anywhere near as good as keeping uh, value as gold has. You know, if, if you had uh, $100 in the 1800s and you saved it as $100, um, it was quite a lot of money. It may be more than a person's yearly income back then, and today you would have just $100. If you had put that in gold, it, it, you would have the same value of roughly more than a, a person's yearly income today. Um, and we know of nothing else that is so good at keeping value um, other than gold. It's quite incredible that the best ledger we have ever found is such a primitive thing that takes billions of dollars to dig it out of the ground, and then we lock it in vaults underground again. It's incredible that with all the technology that we have today, that's the, first, the only one ledger that we can all use where we are not trusting a person, we're not trusting a, a bank or a company or a government, we're just trusting that it's something really scarce. Um, the, 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 the qualities that make gold uh, such a great ledger is that it's so scarce, but it's also divisible, it's portable, it's durable. It's recognizable and it's fungible. About uh, five years ago, at the beginning of 2009, Bitcoin was created. And it's a universal ledger that serves as digital money in a way in which, you, just as like with gold, you don't have to trust anyone. You're not trusting a single person. You're not trusting a company, a bank, or, or, um, uh, or a government. Um, and when you compare Bitcoin to gold is incredibly superior in each one of these aspects. Not by a little bit, by, but by a lot. And it's the first time in 5,000 years that we have something that is immensely superior to gold. The most important way in which it's a lot superior is that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin, period. It's mathematical perfect scarcity. You can trust that. As with gold, we mine more gold every year, about 2,000 tons a year. In terms of the divisibility, each Bitcoin is composed of a million pieces called bits. So a million bits are one Bitcoin. It's incredibly easy to divide. And the portability is also really important. 
up until now, um, if I want to do a transaction with any of you with a dollar or a gold coin, in this room, it's very easy. I can walk up to you, and I, if I voluntarily want to give you a dollar, you take it, and the transaction's done, and we've done a transaction between the two of us without any third party. But the second we want to do a transaction with someone who's not in the room, we always need a third party. And that has been the case forever. You know, we needed, um, that's how banks got started a very long time ago, but that's how we have today also on top of banks, credit cards, and things like PayPal, etc. It's just impossible to do a transaction with someone else without both of us trusting a middleman. What's remarkable about Bitcoin is that it allows us to do a transaction with anyone else in the planet in real time and for free without any third party and without any added trust. You can do a transaction with someone you don't know anywhere in the planet in real time and for free. Think about that for a second. We can call right now someone in Jakarta, Indonesia, and put them in that big screen on Skype for free. We can see them, we can hear them, they can hear us, they can see us. And after we hang up, we want to send them one cent, which should be a lot easier, because that what just happened is quite magic in terms of all the technology that had to be available for us to see them. But when we want to send them one cent, it's just not possible. The few ways there are for us to send them one cent to someone in, in Indonesia will cost at least 50 cents, will take at least three days. But more often, it will take like $50 or more than a week to get there. It's just impossible to move, to move that kind of money. And with Bitcoin, you can move a cent or a million dollars and it's just as quickly and, and, and just as cheaply. It's the first time in 5,000 years that we have something immensely superior to the best form of money we had seen until now. The three functions of money, when money works well, it's a way of saving, it's a way of paying, and it's a way of pricing. Um, as a, as right now, I happen to believe that these are the ways in which Bitcoin is going to develop. Most people who have Bitcoin today are using it as a way of saving. They are not using it for payment so much because there's only about 7 million people who own Bitcoin, so there's not very many people you can transact with, but most of those people are owning Bitcoin because they believe in Bitcoin and they want to save in it. And I think the good thing about the saving function of, of Bitcoin is that if you want to buy some Bitcoin, you don't need to ask anybody's permission. No one needs to accept it. You just buy some Bitcoin and hold them. Whereas for payment, we need a lot of people to accept it. I think that once we have enough people who have Bitcoin for other reasons, it will become a payment mechanism uh, naturally. But I think for now, we are in the first few years stage in which people are adopting Bitcoin mostly to save or as a curiosity. And once we have enough people that own Bitcoin, it will become a payment mechanism um, and naturally, and then if it's used enough as a payment mechanism, it's only natural that it becomes also a way to price things or a unit of account. Since launch, Bitcoin didn't have a, a lot of traction from 2009 to about 2011, and it began to see some serious traction in 2011. This chart is a little old. It's now, now there's about 7 million people who own Bitcoin. There's between 20,000 and 100,000 people who are buying their first Bitcoin every day. I think Bitcoin may be the most important social experiment that is going on right now. And I think it matters because there is a good chance that over the next 20 years, we finally, after 5,000 years, replace, replace the trusty old gold standard for a completely new standard, the Bitcoin standard, that won't, will not and should not ever replace any national currencies but it's likely to become the international currency of the internet, the native digital currency of the internet that the internet doesn't have today, and also probably the biggest leap forward in the democratization of money. And that's why I think it's worth paying attention to what's going on with Bitcoin. Thank you very much.